Nehemiah, and we're going to actually move back into the sixth chapter for our beginning text, and we're going to read verses 53 through about verses 58, 53 through about 58. We actually dealt with this in a different context uh, a couple of months ago, but I want to deal with it in the context of the Lord's Supper today. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. Thank you, and you may be seated. The scripture goes on to say in verse 66 of chapter 6, As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. It's one of those kind of cryptic passages of scripture. John 6, 6, 6, 6, 66. As a result of this, many disciples followed him no more. Clearly one of the things they were struggling with was kind of the understanding and the comprehension of what does it actually mean when Jesus says, my flesh is true fruit and my blood is true true drink and in verse 57 he says as the living father sent me and I live because of the father he who eats me he also will live because of me so as as they wrestled with what Jesus was saying when he says he who protects me protects my flesh and my blood and, and in particular in the past he says he who eats me there was clearly a difficulty understanding exactly what Christ meant in that passage. Even today, in the observance of the Lord's Supper, or what would be referred to as Eucharist, in the Catholic Church, there is a concept called transubstitution. Luther took this and developed it in somewhat similar fashion, although he moved a long way away from it, in a concept called consubstitution. But transubstitution means this. At a moment in which the priest is officiating over the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, and he says, take and eat, this is my body which is broken for you. At the moment in which he says, this is my body which is broken for you, there is the belief that at that moment, the elements, that would be the bread and the wine, become the actual body and blood of Jesus. I was relating to our Sunday school class this morning. There's a story about Martin Luther when he first performed this. He was a young priest, and in the Catholic Church at that time, you had to, as a part of your induction to the priesthood, perform all of the rites, and one of those would, of course, be the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. And the story goes, and I believe it to be true, it's on good report, that as Luther is administering the Lord's Supper, and he says, this is my body which is broken for you, take, that he froze at that moment. He couldn't go on with the observance of it because he looked at the bread in his hand. He said, oh, my goodness, I am holding in my hands the body of Christ. I grant you, that would be an overwhelming thought. But with all due respect to the Catholic Church and certainly to these would-be disciples in John chapter 6, 
I'm very confident they have missed the deeper meaning. That is Christ present with us when we observe the Lord's Supper? Yes. And, and frankly, many times as Protestants, we just kind of rush through this without any thought that his presence is here. We have indeed experienced the presence of the Lord. But it is not so much a physical presence as it is what? A spiritual presence. I do not believe that the bread and the cup actually become the, the body and the blood of Christ when we observe this in a few minutes. That's not what I believe. But I believe in a deeper way that it represents the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And indeed, he is here. And indeed, it is one of the great acts of worship as we think of what Jesus has done for us. And I would say to my Catholic friends, is not the spiritual more significant than the physical? Is not the transformation that Jesus makes in our lives much more than our physical bodies? And I'll make no mistake about it, in heaven we will get a glorified body. So first of all, as we understand this, we have to deal with the symbolism which the scripture does translate for us. But then we deal with a sacrifice that is transfused. This is the beauty of it. You know, when you hear the word transfused, you immediately are thinking of a blood transfusion. And I, and I realize this usually takes place from blood that has been donated or in some ways synthesized. But think of the old method. Think of direct transfusion where you would have one person laying there and the blood was transfused directly from person to person. If you think of this, there is something incredible here. And if you've never seen this before, and especially if you've never thought of this before in the observance of a Lord's Supper, let me challenge you to this because I think this will add new meaning to your observance of it in a few minutes. I think it will help you to worship in a greater way. I challenge all people in worship to look upon the face of Christ, to view him, to see him. Andrew said today that, that we worship with our entire heart, with our mind, with our soul. Yes, the, it does begin with the heart. We would understand that. But, but it also includes the mind and the soul, does it not? The entire nature of our being is wrapped up in the worship of God. I want you to think of this for just a moment. And when you partake of the Lord's Supper in just a moment, I want you to envision Christ. I want you to think of him. As I relate quite often, and even again relate in our Sunday school class, there are two things about Christianity that you cannot make up. And... Things that are true tend to be just a little unique. You ever notice that? How if you were going to make up a story about something, you would try to make all the pieces fit together. The Bible is such a transparent book, is it not? It shows the flaws of the people in it. You know, you know that the, the great King David is a murderer and an adulterer. Now, what other book would have as its primary, or at least one of its great heroes, probably the primary hero of the Old Testament along with Moses and Abraham, just so transparently before you that this man is so incredibly sinful? That alone should tell you that you're probably hearing the truth <laughs> because it's not trying to make everything look good. It's trying to tell you the truth. And likewise, when you look at Jesus and you look at God and the Holy Spirit, of course, and all that, that there is in the nature of God, there's something that, 
that no other religious system even comes close to. That is this. When you look at God, you're looking at his triune nature. This, this is so amazing about God. The Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. People have a hard time grasping that. Let me tell you why you have a hard time grasping that truth. Because God's ways are so far above our ways. You don't make this stuff up. It would not be my purpose to insult other religious systems. But truth is truth. And heresy is heresy. I never want to insult anyone, but I want to point them to the person of Jesus Christ and say this is the way, the truth, and the life. When you look at the person of Jesus, though, you see something so utterly incredible. And here is where I stand somewhat spellbound when I look at Jesus. And I've said this to many people. When I look at Jesus, the thing that grabs me, the thing that rivets me, the thing that just, just focuses me on him is not the fact that he's God. Now that is an incredible reality. Jesus is God. Let's get that out there. But the point of worship for me is even something beyond the fact that he's God, and that is this. His perfect humanity. Fully man and fully God. In fact, if you look at the person of Jesus Christ, the original statement came out something like this, and I don't get too much into these things, but on this, the nail was hit on the head. He is indeed truly God and truly man. He is truly perfect God and truly perfect man. Now here's the neat thing about Jesus. You have the, these two natures. Unconfused, undivided in one person. You have in this one person the God-man. Now we do know this. And in this our illustration is accurate. In a transfusion... Is it not critical to get the right type of blood? Is it not critical that the match is correct? Cannot significant problems occur if there is not a match? Here's what is so neat about Jesus. For him to die for us, he has to be what? Man. Why? Because he's dying for us. I want you to think of this. When I look at him, I see what God intended as I look at the life of Jesus of Nazareth. I see the life that God intended me to live and you to live, but guess what? Did you do it? Did, did you live that life that God intended for you to live? It is so beautiful to understand the plan of a perfect, holy, almighty God that, that the sending of his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross was not an afterthought, but the sacrifice that was planned from the very foundation of the world. Now let me go back and say this. Does that not get at the heart of why there has to be a triune God? The second person of the Godhead was born of a virgin. Perfect God perfect man. You don't make this stuff up. For us, there had to be a perfect God man to die on the cross. And his righteousness was transfused. The theological term, his righteousness is imputed into me. Praise his name. Magnify his name. He has given life to me when no one else could. He has given meaning to me when no one else possibly could. Where would you be without Jesus? Would not your condition be absolutely hopeless without the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary? Would it not be? Is he not transforming us into his image? Does he not take that which is most precious? Think of this as he dies on the cross and that blood falls off the cross of Calvary. Is it not being offered to us? As the songwriter wrote, there is a fountain filled with blood. 
And I think the thing I look forward to in heaven is I'll actually be able to sing that and not just recite it. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stain. How incredible that scene is, the transfusion. I owe a debt to God that only I owe, but it is a debt that only God can pay. The uniqueness of Christianity is seen in the fact that God had this plan all along. And when this perfect human, the only perfect human that ever lived, the only one that fully fulfilled God's plan for his life dies on the cross, he pays that for my sin. He becomes the great substitutionary atonement. All of that is wrapped up. His sinless life, his death is all wrapped up. And as you partake of the Lord's Supper, I want you to think of that. The great symbolism here. The symbolism, trust me, the symbolism is greater than if it actually became the actual body and the blood. Yes, the actual body and the blood was spilled, but think, think of the spiritual reality that is here. That is transferred to me. Let me ask this question. What would be the greatest insult you could give to the person of Christ? What would be the, the greatest spiritual slap on the face? The greatest spiritual literally spitting on the person of Christ. Or as Hebrews ask us this question this way, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Think of that. Would it not be the height of insult just to look upon Jesus as a good man? Yeah, he's perfect. But I want you to think of this. The humanity reaches to us, and the divinity reaches to God. Think of this. Think of the cross for just a moment, not as vertical, but leaning over. One arm reaching to man. The other arm reaching to God. Now think of that. Could anybody but Jesus save you? What hope would you have without him? And then we move to the third point as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper. It is a salvation that will transcend. The beauty of having a God that plans everything out eternally <laughs> is multifaceted. One of the great realities is that God is bringing us into his presence. Think of that. We could go many directions with that. We don't have time, obviously, because we are getting ready to observe the Lord's Supper. But it says this in verses 26 and following of 1 Corinthians 11. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, you show the Lord's death until he comes. Think of that. That every time we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are, if you will, connecting the past with the future. The present. Looking forward to the return of Christ. Looking back to the death, burial, and resurrection. In fact, there's a passage in Revelation 19, I want you to think of this. And it's what I believe to be the last observance of the Lord's Supper. I will say it's not the easiest passage to interpret. But I do believe it is the last observance of the Lord's Supper. In Revelation 19, 7 through following, it says this, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him. For the mayor's lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. 
For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. John was so overcome that he fell at the feet of the angel who was showing him these things to worship. And the angel reminded him, do not worship me, for I am here only pointing you to God. But I want you to think of that. The Bible here, and, and the Gospels are resplendent with allusions to this. Those that are invited to the supper. Here it culminates in Revelation 19, the marriage supper and the Lamb. I want you to think of this. As you're preparing your heart now to partake of the Lord's Supper, this great symbolism, this great spiritual act that connects you with God, as you recognize the sacrifice of his body and blood on the cross of Calvary, this passage would say God is also inviting us to one last observance. As the scripture says, we do show the Lord's death until he comes. So, it's fascinating. Think of that. You do show the Lord's death until he comes. In Revelation 19, 7 through 10, the marriage supper of the Lamb is recorded. Guess what the next event recorded in the scripture after the marriage supper of the Lamb is in Revelation 19? Guess what it is? I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him is called faithful and true. It is clearly the second coming of Christ. In other words, after Christ's raptured church observes the Lord's Supper, we will then come back with him. And we will reign with him forever and ever and ever. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. As we prepare for the observance of the Lord's Supper today, the scripture says this, that a man is to examine himself. Now, I am not a priest, so you don't have to confess your sin to me. I'm glad to talk to somebody if they have a problem. I want to pray, glad to do that. But what the scripture tells us is that we examine ourselves before we come to observe the Lord's Supper. Let me say this. As we come to the observance of the Lord's Supper, there are just two very important prerequisites for you observing the Lord's Supper. Number one is that you're saved. We here at Emmett Grove Baptist Church practice what is known as open communion, open observance of the Lord's Supper. That, is me, that means simply this. If you're a believer in Christ Jesus, you are invited to partake of the Lord's Supper. Now, this doesn't come from me. This comes from God. But if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, we have an invitation for you at the end of the Lord's Supper. And we would invite you not to participate, not on our authority, but upon what the Scripture says. For indeed, the Lord's Supper is for believers. The second thing is, if you are a believer, then you need to make sure that your sins are confessed. But let a man examine himself. So we're going to Bow our heads, close our eyes, and have a moment of silence. But don't just sit there. In this moment of silence, ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins and prepare your heart for an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and pray. Amen.